Pretty much everyone uses the capo wrong. What? How? Well, I'm glad you asked. Show me what you do. What do you do? I take my capo, put it just behind the fret, and strum my open chords. And you're in tune? Uh, yeah, it was when I put the capo on. G-string sounds a little flat there, bud. Okay, well, I'll tune it. No, there's a better way than that. Try again. Okay, well, I'll just take the capo off and tune it. Neither of these options is ideal. Let me show you how to make fine tuning adjustments when using a capo. If you need your string to be a little bit flatter, you give it a pull down here. And if you need it to be a bit sharper, you give it a squeeze behind the nut up here. Really what you're doing is just changing the tension of the string without fiddling around with the tuning machine. And the great thing is, when you take your capo off, you're still gonna be perfectly in tune. For the longest time, I thought amps that have two inputs like this were made that way so that you and your buddy could use the same amp and save a bit of money on gear. But if you've tried this, you know it sounds terrible and it's definitely not how these are meant to be used. Let me tell you how they are meant to be used. If you're using a quieter guitar, say something with single coils, you would put it in input one. But if you're using a louder guitar, say something with humbuckers, you would use input two as input two is a little bit quieter. That way, both those guitars are gonna interact with the amp in the same way. This is the way these are meant to be used, though I almost always use input two and then compensate by turning up the volume, because I personally like the sound of an amp that's working a bit harder. It's painful seeing how many people wrap cables the wrong way. You got this one, where you're just giving her with your forearm. For this one, just spiraling it over and over again. When you unwrap those, you're gonna get knots, you're gonna get your cables bunching up like this. Let me show you how to make every roadie, every sound guy, every engineer love you for the rest of time. Here's the proper way to wrap a cable. Hold your cable in one hand, make a loop, but instead of just repeating that motion over and over again, now what you're gonna do is flip your hand over, grab the cable here, pull it around. This is called the over-under method, and then you repeat. Normal, and then you go under following the natural coil of the cable until the whole thing is perfectly wrapped up. And then when you go to unwind the cable, no bunching, no knots. Now the only problem is if when you go to unwind your cable, one end goes through the loop, you do end up with a bit of a knot situation. However, if you wrap your cable properly, you do not need to worry, this is easy to deal with. You track down the first knot, put your hand through it, follow it along until you get to your next knot, put your hand through it, Keep going all the way through until you find the end of the cable. Then you pull your cable all the way through and guess what? You now have a perfectly unknotted, beautiful cable. And that is how you deal with a cable properly. If you feel like you're doing the learning or playing side of guitar things wrong, I'm gonna take a second here to let you know that you can probably fix that using my lessons over at SamuraiGuitarTheory.com. Over there, I show you how to take the guesswork out of music making. We look under the hood of music and figure out why it works the way it does. Why do the notes A, C, E, and G make an A minor seven? What is a B Phrygian mode? Why does it have an F sharp in it? And why does it sound the way it does? Why do we always see Gs, Ds, E minors, and Cs in the same song? These are the kind of questions and more that we look at in my courses at the Root and beyond the basics. In my course, The Craft of Soloing, we look at the element of musical storytelling when it comes to soloing. In my course, The Style of Soloing, we look at the fun stuff, the flavor, the cherry we put on the musical cake, the flashy elements that bring your solo to life. And for a little bit longer, the back to school sale is going on, so you can get anything over there, courses, bundles, whatever, half off if you use promo code back to school 23 at checkout. You can find more information at samuraiguitartheory.com. I've also got a links in the description. And there's an extra special promo going on for this video. Five of you are going to get the complete Sam Samurai Guitar Theory experience completely free. The link to the giveaway is in the description as well. A surprising amount of guitarists don't know how to use all the functions of their string winders. You got the winder itself, that's pretty self-explanatory. The clippers, also day one stuff. But a shocking amount of people don't know that this indent here is for popping out your bridge pins. No more sticking your finger in your guitar and pushing it up like a goblin. There's two important steps that are all too often forgotten when cleaning your guitar. First of all is using a fret polisher to, you guessed it, polish your frets. These are special slightly abrasive cloths that just get all the dirt and grime off your frets. And besides that, if you've got an ebony or rosewood fretboard, like this guitar here, applying a little bit of lemon oil now and then and rubbing it in with a rag is gonna keep your fretboard clean, conditioned, and happy. Neither of these products is expensive. If you need them, I got links in the description. I'm embarrassed to admit how long it took me to learn the proper way of restringing a guitar. Pull the string all the way through, then pull it backwards the length of one fret, crimp it here, then wrap it with your string winder, pure and perfect every time. This is so much better than the way everybody normally does it, where you're wrapping it around the pole, 
feeding it through the hole, trying not to stab yourself under the fingernail, and then you're dealing with the string bunching up, you're dealing with it winding over top of itself. No, big thanks to Rhett Shaw for showing me the proper way to do this. A guitar strap is actually not just for holding up your guitar. And my God, I wish someone had told me this before my grade eight talent show. I was playing Smells Like Teen Spirit with the fellas. I stepped up to take the guitar solo. And in doing so, I accidentally stepped on my cable, unplugging my guitar. If I'd used my strap as kind of a cable support system, wrapping my cable around it before plugging in, then when I stepped on the cable, it would have stayed connected and I would have rocked everybody's socks off. But instead, I froze up and I'm left with the image of my middle school crush, Lisa Hildebrand, laughing at me from the front row. Still haunts me to this day. You gotta take your favorite instrument on a flight. What do you typically do? I've got a guitar to check in and yes, I'm aware that there's a relatively high chance that it shows up in multiple pieces or it just doesn't show up at all. But my friends, there's a better way. Sir, may I please gate check my guitar? And in doing so, you're gonna take your instrument through security and drop it off right before you set foot on the plane. This makes it one of the last things that gets packed into the cargo and they're supposed to treat it with a little bit of extra care. Now, ideally, you'll be able to get your instrument into the cabin, but uh, good luck with that one and sometimes they just won't let you do this for some unknown reason. Flying with an instrument sucks. Hopefully this tip can sometimes make it a little less terrible. I used to work in a music store and you'd have people bring their guitars in, but the latch on the case would be all busted up. I'd ask them if their guitar case got in a fight or something, to which they would reply, no, they locked the case, lost the key, and had to break their guitar out. But I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. Most of these keys are a one size fits all situation. Both these cases are locked, same key, So if you do lock yourself out, borrow your buddy's key or grab one from the guitar store. No need to bring out the sledgehammer. Though really, I don't know why people even use the locks. If someone's gonna steal your guitar, they're gonna take the case anyway. A lot of guitarists will treat their volume knob as a binary thing. If they're playing something, they turn it all the way up. And if they want their guitar silent, they turn it all the way down. But I'm here to tell you that there's more to the volume knob than that. Using your volume knob to change how much of your signal you're sending into something like a drive pedal can drastically alter the sound of that drive pedal. For example, here I am going into an overdrive turned all the way up. keep all my settings the same, but listen to the different tone I get when I turn my volume down about 25%. Using the volume knob to alter your tone throughout a song or even a solo can add a lot. And of course, let's also not forget about those volume swells. If you have a tube amp, it probably has a standby switch, and if it has a standby switch, you're probably using it wrong. The standbys kind of become the de facto amp mute button. You're taking a set break, so flip the standby switch, amp's muted, right? Well, this actually isn't good for the amp, and it's not what this was designed for. What you're meant to do is turn the amp on, wait a little bit for the amp to warm up, and then flick the standby switch. That's it, you don't touch it again until it's time to turn the amp off. If you do need to mute things, then do it somewhere else in the signal chain or just turn your amp off. For the longest time, the whammy bar would drive me a little bit crazy. It'd either be dangling there, getting in your way all loose and pathetic, or you'd screw it in and it'd be just locked in place. There's no happy medium, right? Wrong, there is in fact a happy medium and it comes in the form of these little springs of fender cells. You drop a spring in the whammy hole, Screw your bar back in, and it gives you the perfect amount of resistance. If you need to pick up some of those springs, I've got a link in the description. If you're using a metronome to practice, you're already getting a passing grade in my book. However, there is a more efficient way to use the metronome than what most of us naturally gravitate towards. When practicing, you'll usually set the metronome so that it clicks on every beat. So if I'm working on something that's 120 beats per minute, that would sound like this. Instead of setting the metronome so that it triggers on the first, second, third, and fourth beat of the bar, you have it triggering half as much on the second and fourth beat, you're gonna be forced to fill in those gaps with your internal time feel, which is gonna do wonders for your sense of rhythm. And by setting it on the second and four, it kind of creates a groove within the metronome, which creates a groove within you. Here's how this would sound. This is more important when you're working on groove and rhythm based stuff, but it still never hurts to use this when you're working on scales and other menial tasks like that. Ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. Those are a bunch of guitar things 
that you are probably doing wrong. And remember, if you feel like you're doing the playing side of guitar things wrong, then one of the best resources out there, in my completely unbiased opinion, is my course platform, SamuraiGuitar3.com. And for a little bit more time, you can get anything over there, any course, any bundle, half off, and use promo code back to school at 23 at checkout. You can find more information, SamuraiGuitar3.com. I'll also put up links in the description. Thank you all for watching. If you're new here, stick around for a bit. I got some cool stuff coming down the pipeline. Until next time, look after yourselves, look after each other, look after the planet. I'm Samurai Guitarist, and I'll see you again soon.